Karl Popper. Well, I'm sorry. English characters, Karl Popper. Well, this is already the 20th century. Uh, maybe I've told you uh, a few things about Karl Popper during my previous lecture when we spoke about Wittgenstein's poker. Or it was not touched. No, because I have, I'm doing many lectures and so uh, maybe I've just uh, mixed up what I've told you and what I've told another group. Anshita, do you remember something about Wittgenstein's poker? The the conflict between Popper and Wittgenstein. Uh, the, when we you told us last time. Yes. Wittgenstein, you remember we spoke about Wittgenstein. And uh, have I told you anything about his conflict with Karl Popper? Uh, he is atheist and uh, he is believer in God, God and religion. Uh, I mean Wittgenstein. He... Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that Wittgenstein is a... Well, yes, he ended with a, a kind of... Well, I can say it was a conversion, but he invited Catholic priest and was buried in Cambridge on Catholic cemetery. This, I mean, Wittgenstein. But I, well, if I haven't told you and you don't remember, uh, so I will uh, speak about that uh, episode during today's lecture. Uh, so uh, just repetition is the mother of studies, you know. Uh, so, um, uh, well, uh, I never know what percentage of my the information that I share is somehow storaged in your brain okay so it's always a mystery you have to about uh, Ludwig Witt Wittgenstein yes yes it's uh, a, 1921 yes. he has born and attracted uh, us no, 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 he was not born 1921 he was born in 1889 okay. in 1921 he wrote his famous uh, book Check, check uh, us. Atos, Logica Philosophicus. Okay, so that was Wittgenstein. Today is Karl Popper, but their uh, biographies are intertwined. You understand? Intertwined. Well, yes, okay. Do you know this word intertwine? So no. mix up somehow. Twine are twins, are uh, just. Um, twins are just uh, brothers and sisters which are resemble each other very much. Intertwine, I think it's uh, like um, be closely connected with each other. Angel Sierra, am I right about intertwine to intertwine or intertwined? Yes, the relation be between the two. Yes, close relations. Close. So. I would say that Karl Popper's and Wittgenstein's biographies are closely intertwined, okay? So, and I will explain why. So, uh, Karl Popper was born in 1802, also in Vienna, like Wittgenstein. But you see, there is the difference of 23 years between them. So Wittgenstein can act like a father you know, he belongs to a different generation. Uh, and Wittgenstein, as you remember, took part in the First World War as an officer and was taken prisoner. And uh, uh, Karl Popper was too young to take part in the war because when the war started, he was only 12 years old. So he didn't take part in the war. You understand? Because he was a child. Uh, so this makes a difference. So, um, and also what is different is that Karl Popper started his activity in post-war Austria, which was um, heavily damaged by the war. Many people were uh, 
many children were left orphans, many families were destroyed, um, uh, about one million people, uh, males mostly, have died uh, during the war. Okay, so now, then there was also a decay or uh, like, um, uh, well, um, of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So it was divided into several small states, Czechoslovakia, uh, Austria, Hungary, uh, part of it went to Croatia, well, the Croatia went to United Yugoslavia, uh, part of um, uh, the territory of Austria-Hungarian Empire went to Poland. So uh, out of this Austria-Hungarian Empire, only Austria remained. It was uh, like one six, I, th I think, of its former territory. So, uh, of course, those ties, economic ties, which existed before the war, were shattered. So, uh, and also uh, because uh, Austria was uh, like uh, not victorious, but uh, say the defeated country. So it had to pay compensation or, uh, well, um, how to say, um, well, uh, many, many things happened also hyperinflation and uh, other uh, um, evil things. So uh, Austrian population suffered terribly during the 20s. And uh, in this atmosphere, Karl Popper um, went to uh, study psychology uh, with a famous psychologist and uh, this pupil of Sigmund Freud, who was called Alfred Adler. Well, why do I depict this, all these ne negative things? Because Alfred Adler uh, was trying to help um, like uh, uh, adolescents with psychological problems. And there were many of them because of this terrible economic situation and because of that many of these adolescents lost their fathers during the war. So they were orphans or partly orphans. Only mother remained, but mother had to work to provide for the family. So these children were left without paternal and maternal care and sort of uh, banished or thrown into the streets, okay, where they had to somehow to survive, okay. So uh, that's why uh, there was increased incidence of criminal um, like crimes, uh, like of adolescence and other problems. So uh, psychologists were mobilized uh, or called to somehow work with these problems. So Alfred Adler, well, as a pupil of uh, Sigmund Freud, he adopted Freudian idea of uh, mm, uh, like helping the psychological peoples with people with psychological problems. Well, the main idea of Sigmund Freud was that uh, liberation or recovery comes through understanding. So if you understand your problem, then you will recover. And Al Alfred Adler suggested the idea that uh, the, the cause of many adolescent problems of troubled adolescents was the inferiority complex. Inferiority complex. Mm. You remember that uh, Freud uh, gave, was famous for his so-called uh, Oedip Oedipus complex. Uh, oh. Oops. Oedipus complex. So now it is another complex, inferiority complex. So what is complex in psychology? Complex is a like a, a, a certain tension which exists, which exists in a, a patient and is most uh, is mostly 
uh, burned into subconsciousness. So a, a person does not understand that he's suffering from this or that complex. So the recovery is uh, in explaining a person that he's suffering from this or that complex. So there are many, maybe many complexes. Uh, okay, but uh, well, uh, Freud thought that the, the, the most important, the core complex is the Oedipus complex. So it is uh, like, um, uh, its uh, roots are in the relations with the parents, okay? Uh, but Alfred Adler th thought that the uh, inferiority complex is the most important because every person wants to dominate and to exert power over other people. And if he's hindered by some circumstances, say mm, uh, he's of low height or he's not very good looking or he has low intellect. So all these things hamper his um, like leadership over others. And so uh, if a person sees or imagines that this or that quality of his or lack, lacking of such a, such a quality hampers his dominate, do, uh, domination over others, he develops an uh, inferiority complex, okay? Well, we can call it just uh, in common language, jealousy, for example, or hurt pride, you understand. But these are not psychological uh, terms. These are just ordinary speech. You remember we began our, our seminars with this um, difference between ordinary language or ordinary, ordinary knowledge and scientific knowledge. So Adler, of course, thought that he was a true scientist. So he didn't want to speak just about jealousy or hurt pride, but he developed a, um, like a, ter a, a terminology certain. And one of these terms which he coined was inferiority complex. So according to Alfred Adler, um, uh, to, to cure those troubled adolescents was to explain to them that they suffer from inferiority complex and when they would understand that they are really suffering from this inferiority complex, they would recover. Just understanding brings recovery. This is the common uh, feature of every psychotherapy, Freudian or Adlerian or, or, um, or others. So, well, um, uh, so young Karl Popper became a, a student or a helper of Alfred Adler. So. Uh, he was uh, uh, doing psychology. Later, he entered Vienna University and received his PhD in sociology. But this is close, connected to psychology. So uh, it is interesting that Popper started as a psychologist. And what happened in his relations with Alfred Adler? At first, all went smoothly. So Popper was actively um, uh, helping these troubled adolescents, being young man himself uh, of about 19 years old when he uh, started working for Adler. So it was shortly after the war. And uh, well, at first all went well, but then there was a, some kind of a conflict between young Karl Popper and Alfred Adler. So Karl Popper was very ambitious and um, he thought that he helped a certain adolescent and it was, according to Karl Popper, a complicated case. So he was very proud that he could help this troubled adolescent's uh, recovery. And uh, so he wanted to say, uh, give a presentation of his results um, to Alfred Adler. But Alfred Adler was like many um, uh, distinguished people was very busy and he had no time to listen to Karl Popper's uh, like um, um, discoveries or his uh, views and he said well uh, let's dismiss it it's just one uh, ag ag again it's one of the cases of inferiority complex from what you 
tell me I can see that this uh, youngster suffers from inferiority complex, so there's nothing interesting in this case. And uh, Karl Popper was very much offended. And uh, he said, well, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Alfred Adler added, well, I've seen thousand, a thousand of such cases. And uh, Karl Popper retorted or just spoke, um, uh, you, you understand, gave a replica. So now you will see that you've uh, seen 1,001 1, such cases. So you will add just such case to your 1,000 without even seeing this adolescent by your own eyes. So what cost are all those your sort of um, uh, um, uh, observations if you just don't want to uh, enter into details. And then, then uh, well, there was a conflict after which perhaps uh, uh, Popper discontinued to help Adler and started, he started his uh, university uh, um, uh, uh, like education. And, but he remembered it sort of stayed in his memory, this episode, and later he came to, by, thanks to this episode, he came to his so-called falsification principle. So he just wanted to understand what was, the, what was wrong with this uh, attitude of Alfred Adler. And he thought that Alfred Adler was wrong, not in uh, that uh, way that he arrogantly dismissed young Popper, but the whole, uh, say, the whole approach was wrong uh, because it couldn't be falsified. So inferiority complex, if I say, say uh, that, uh, well, if somebody will say that I have an inferiority complex, it would be very difficult for me to prove that he's wrong, that I have no inferiority complex. Because if I, he says, well, mm, I, I can say, well, I have no inferiority complex, I let my lectures be um, sort of posted in YouTube. So I am sort of confident in myself. I don't have inferiority complex. Well, this psychologist could say, well, that's why are you insisting on putting your uh, lectures on YouTube? Because you have an inferiority complex, which is in your subconsciousness, and you want by getting lots uh, under your lectures, you want to sort of cure yourself from that inferiority complex. So you see. Now an another scenario. I say I don't want my lectures to be published, uh, to be made uh, sort of um, uh, accessible to everyone. Oh, he will say, you are afraid, perhaps, you are afraid that people will see your mistakes in English or in uh, just some other uh, well, you're, that you mix up some facts, uh, misinterpret them. So you don't want to sort of um, be observed by everyone. So you want to remain hidden. So this is because you have an inferiority complex. So you see uh, one strategy and another opposite strategy and the explanation is the same. So uh, now uh, uh, for, um, Popper said, so can we imagine a crucial experiment which will prove that this or that person has no inferiority complex? So this experiment, this situation cannot be imagined because every fact can be interpreted in this way, okay? So uh, now the same goes if we take now Sigmund Freud, the father of psychoanalysis, the same situation can be applied to so-called interpretation of dreams, which is the core uh, cornerstone of, um, say, Freudian psychotherapy, interpretation of dreams. So ca how can we prove that the psychoanalysis interpre interprets your dreams in the right way? Maybe he's uh, uh, mistaken, um, who knows? But this is, cannot be put into question. Uh, so you must believe, uh, blindly believe your therapist. Otherwise, uh, the therapy will not work. So here again is um, uh, this idea that you cannot test 
your uh, psychiatrist or so your psychologist because if you try to test him that means that you are don't, uh, sort of doubting him if you doubt him that means that you don't believe him if you don't believe him all therapy will be futile so you will not be uh, you will not at attain recovery so here is a, like a, a vicious circle you understand um, so you cannot come out of it so uh, that uh, prompted Karl Popper the idea that perhaps this falsification principle can be uh, used for demarcation of science and pseudoscience. So in case of strict science like Einstein's theory of general relativity, you can uh, have some tests which can confirm or reject it. After the rejection, for example, if you say well, a uh, typical example of Karl Popper is not, of course, general theory of relativity, it's too uh, complicated, but he gives a rather simple example. Say your theory is that all swans are white. So now, how can it be disproved? Uh, by just showing you the black swan. Well, the black swans are um, swan, yes? Um, it's okay, swan, uh, Mehdi, swan, it's a bird, like, uh, I, can I can give you uh, uh, a definition of it. A, li a large water bird with long flexible necks, short legs, webbed feet, a broad bill, and typically all white plumage. Uh, well, that's, I will write in chat, uh, so you that can see. That is also uh, an Oscar-winning movie. Yes, now we know that in Australia, there are uh, black swans, swans, yes? How do you pronounce it, swan? Anshita. It can be pronounced as, as both of uh, like swan or swan. Uh, in their pronunciation is swan. Swan, okay. So, so black swans exist. And this disproves the idea that all swans are white, okay? So now we can say typically all white plumage. Typically, but not exclusively. So there are exceptions. Okay, so you the, the, the affirmation that all swans are white uh, white is false. It is falsified. But because it could be falsified, it is scientific. So all your affirmation, uh, which can be in principle falsified, are scientific. Most theories are not yet falsified. But Popper says uh, they can be in principle falsified. We can imagine the situation when, say, uh, this, uh, this or that affirmation can be falsified or verified. So uh, with the uh, psychoanalysis, this will, will not go because psychoanalysis cannot be in principle falsified. You see, uh, inferiority complex, Oedipus complex, um, uh, uh, interpretation of dreams, they are built in such a way that you cannot falsify them in principle, okay? So this makes, according to Karl Popper, psychoanalysis a pseudoscience. The same goes with Marxism. Well, uh, next target of Karl Popper, Marxism. So Marxism can explain everything. For example, if we take October Revolution in Russia, you can say, well, that is a... a a proof that um, capitalism is vicious and it was supplanted by socialism. So there was a change, a revolution, and it confirms a Marxist theory. Now we see that in Russia, unfortunately for Marxist, uh, um, uh, socialism ended and capitalism was restored, okay? So now we have private property exploitation and uh, all the evils of capitalism, inflation, uh, unemployment, you see a class struggle, only we don't have strikes, but maybe uh, in future we'll have them also. 
well, strikes are not so popular now uh, in, in Russia. But of course, we have uh, communists who are in opposition to the government and say that uh, this, um, uh, that we, we should restore again socialism and so on. But uh, when we take this restoration of capitalism in Russia, how will Marxist explain it? This is not uh, uh, like a definite uh, like uh, falsification of Marxism, not at all. Marxists continue to exist, continue to gain um, force. And uh, well, I've seen uh, recently uh, a YouTube lecture in Rush in English given by a Russian young professor, Alexander Karyagin, uh, a lecture on Karl Marx. In the beginning, Alexander Karyagin said that he's a Marxist, okay? So you can see it in YouTube, Alexander, Alexander Koryagin. Just, uh, just, uh, you, uh, see, uh, just uh, uh, um, uh, take the, how to say, search in YouTube and you will see his lectures. So you can uh, choose a le his lecture on Marx. It was published quite recently. Uh, no, not, not, not many people ha have uh, viewed it still. So you can see that in the beginning of this lecture, he declares himself a Marxist. So after all these events, the restoration of capitalism in uh, Russia, he still thinks that Marxism is like um, unconquerable, okay? So um, not disproved, not falsified. It's still a valid concept for him. Now we can ask what perhaps, uh, uh, um, say, um, world event in economics or in politics can in principle disprove of um, sort of uh, falsify Marxism. And I think, and uh, Popper also is of this opinion that nothing can falsify it. Marxist will explain everything, every scenario, uh, whatever uh, will appear because they are not sort of um, disappointed when they see difficulties they manage somehow to explain all the events, okay? So this is, uh, according to Popper, not a good uh, sort of feature of Marxism, but um, it, is, it proves, uh, on the contrary, its unscientific character. Now, uh, after defeating somehow uh, psychoanalysis and Marxism, Popper starts with evolution theory. And he sees that in this explanation that all is the result of evolution is also uh, sort of cannot be falsified because we can say, well, we have say um, uh, the developed eye. And if we compare it with the eye of say primitive mammals or even uh, say uh, insects, we see that the, our eye, human eye is much more developed. So how it could appear when uh, uh, so, such a complex, um, say, device, how it could appear uh, by bl blind chance uh, from an in, in, in inanimate nature, okay? But the biologist will say, well, this is evolution, because if we have good eyesight, it helps us in uh, struggle for life, in natural selection, okay? Well, this is good. Uh, of course, I understand that if I have good eyesight, it can help me in natural selection. For example, I can um, be become a good hunter, for example, if I have good eyesight. If I have bad eyesight, if I am suffer from my myopia, you understand, short-sightedness, then of course I can't be a good hunter. Okay, so I won't kill enough animals, and so I will not survive. Okay, so, but does it explain, so everything that happens in nature is explained by this uh, just, uh, I would say, phrase, this is the result of evolution and natural selection. So, and uh, now can we imagine some experiment or some situation or some fact that will disprove 
Darwinian theory of evolution. And we cannot find it because, well, uh, and, uh, and we can, uh, okay, so uh, these are three uh, so, so, so called targets of Popper's falsification principle. So, uh, well, um, uh, what Popper considers to be a true science? Popper considers a true science to be uh, physics and chemistry and to some extent biology. Well, uh, when Popper criticized a uh, theory of evolution, there was not yet a developed genetics. Now we can analyze the genome, okay? So now we can see how uh, certain parts of genome um, somehow we can find in rats and in humans and uh, how, say, uh, all these uh, um, mechanisms of, uh, say, reproduction of uh, DNA are the same with all, um, uh, say, animals and uh, all, all living beings. And now we can speak that uh, not just, so uh, it is not that uh, we can, in principle, uh, Darwin's theory of evolution could be falsified. If we found, for example, in case we found that human DNA is quite dissimilar to the DNA of the monkey. But we see that in all these DNAs, the same mechanism is at work. So uh, the same enzymes, the same, uh, say, uh, letters, I would say, in double commas, of this genetic alphabet are in work with all human with all living beings okay with plants with animals everywhere so we can see that life really comes from one source okay so this can be regarded as a confirmation of darwinian evolution because uh, in case we we have found that say humans are biologically quite different from say monkeys then it would be a kind of a, a disproof or kind of uh, well um, say uh, uh, well uh, yes disproof you understand uh, of uh, theory of evolution so it was not disproved by real uh, now uh, very strict genetic observations so now this um, genetics can give us objective tests of darwinian evolution okay uh, now uh, so the, evo the so uh, evolution theory was sort some somehow rehabilitated and uh, popper later said that it was some blunder of his so he in in view of these new discoveries in genetics he takes away his words about Darwinian evolution being a pseudoscience, okay? Now, again, it uh, is reestablished as strict science. In as far as we analyze the genetic material, okay? So, for example, uh, there's, there are some questions on Russian television whether this or that person is mother a biological father or mother of this or that girl and boy, okay? Because there's disputed thing. Father says, that, no, I'm not the father of this child, okay? I don't want to pay for this child, okay? For, its ed for his education, his or her education or so on. And then mother says, well, uh, she appeals to a court and the court and the court appeals to genetic expertise. So this is a the case of falsification. So this is science. This uh, affirmation of this or that father or mother can be falsified. So we are dealing with science, not with just uh, uh, inferiority complexes, okay? So this is solid thing, okay? So this genetic expertise give, answers yes or no. This is science. According to Popper, this is science. When we can get definite results, yes or no, okay? So this is a 
uh, what distinguishes science from pseudoscience according to Karl Popper and his famous falsification principle. This principle was formulated by him when he was only 32 years old. It was uh, published, uh, or it was formulated in his work, which he published in Austria, uh, in German, which can be translated as, uh, um, uh, well, uh, uh, sort of, uh, um, uh, uh, science or, or how to say, um, well, I forgotten that uh, Forschung, it's a uh, Forschung, Forschung. Um, it's uh, in German, it's uh, uh, investigation. So, um, well, just a moment, I will see it. A logic der Forschung, yes. I've forgotten the simple word. Logik der Forschung, it's uh, in German. Or logic of investigation. Logik der Forschung. This was published in German. Uh, you can see this work uh, in, in, in German, but later he translated it into English after the war in uh, 19... Uh, 59 there appeared the book in English logic of scientific discovery well scientific discovery is not just a good term to trans exact term to translate forschung because forschung means just investigation and not discovery okay but uh, well so it uh, this English variant uh, logic of scientific discovery uh, is uh, like a um, he somehow uh, sort of reworks his first German book and publish, publishes it in English. Logic of scientific discovery. This can be read in English, so it's easier for you to read it, scientific discovery. Well, this happened after the war. Now, after, uh, so Anshita, we'll have to uh, re, um, how to say, say to we enter into the same link, same link. Yes, in, in one minute we'll just use the same link. Yes, yeah, to, but uh, shall we need to take a five minutes break? Okay, okay, five minutes break. Okay, so we have just uh, in five minutes we'll meet again by the same link. Okay, yeah, sure, very good. Yeah, I'm waiting for you. Okay, so yes, okay.